here. How many of you know all of your help comes from the Lord? Come on, quiet. Say, hey, all of my help, all of my help comes from the Lord. I'm looking up to him. Come on, y'all.
one more time for the Holy Spirit. Let the church say amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. I don't know what you come to do, but I come to lift up the name of Jesus. Is there anybody with me this morning that come to lift up the name of Jesus? Because I found out that he is worthy to be praised. I, we had a good time last last evening with the kickoff and what I want us to do is to just follow through with what God is about to do. Let us pray. Gracious and all wise God in the name of Jesus we come to you once again. Lord we thank you Lord. We thank you for life, health and the portion of strength that you've given us. Lord Heavenly Father we thank you for your darling son Jesus who died on the cross that we may have the right to the tree of life. But Lord, we realize that you did not allow him to stay dead. He got up on the third day with all power in his hand. And for that, we say thank you. Lord, I ask, Lord, for a special thank you, Lord, for those that are under the sound of my voice. Lord, give them the utterance to continue to praise you. Lord, give them, Heavenly Father, to heart, the heart, Heavenly Father, to worship you. Now, Heavenly Father, while we're here, Lord, we're here to lift up your name and to hear a word. I'll say it again. We're here to lift up your name and hear a word. I'll say it one more time. We're here to lift up your name and hear a word. These things we ask in your precious and righteous name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Psalms 118 says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Come on, come on, come on. Let us rejoice. Oh, glory. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Come on, sing with me. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord, come on, come on, I will rejoice, come on, I will rejoice and be glad, and be, oh, this is, come on, man. Come on, this is that. Come on, let's sing that one more time. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, this is. Sing it like you mean it. This is that the Lord, that the Lord, I will rejoice and be glad. is the day that the Lord come on come on let's take I, I will I will it's with Thanksgiving yeah yeah hallelujah I will this is the day that the Lord I will Come on, let's do that again. I will with thanksgiving. I will I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has Come on, he has. If he's made you glad, I will. 
he has made he has made me glad i will rejoice for now now let's do something a little different right now we're just going to have the instrumental version and we're going to clap right now come on yeah Hallelujah. He has made. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. I will. is the day. Come on, come on, one more time. This is hallelujah that the Lord come on, sing it now. I will rejoice hallelujah and the Lord and will oh this is the day this is the day that the Lord has made come on clap your hands clap your hands if you believe it clap your hands we give God honor and praise Amen, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, I said hallelujah right now, we thank you, we thank you, he has made me glad, he has made me glad, yes Lord, yes Lord, yes Lord, yes Lord, yes Lord, glory to God. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Amen. Oh, magnify today. We're here to magnify the Lord today. Am I right about it? Hallelujah. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. We're here to magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord for he. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, oh, magnify the Lord, for he, Hosanna, blessed be, oh, blessed be. Come on, let's try that one more time. Oh, oh. oh he, do you believe he's worthy? Oh, magnify the Lord. For oh, he, come on, sing it like you mean it. Come on, hold oh, it. Blessed be, blessed be the rock. Ooh, Hosanna. Blessed be, blessed be the rock. Come on, come on, let's try it again. Oh, back. Come on, come on for those that can stand on your feet. Stand on your feet and sing this with me. For ye. That's where I get excited. Hold it up. Blessed be. Blessed be the rock. Blessed. Blessed be. 
blessed be. Come on, blessed be. Blessed be the Lord. I'm glad. Blessed. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. One more. Two more times. One more time. For my salvation. Come on, clap your hands right now. It's getting hot in here. I feel the, the heat of the Holy Spirit inside here. How many feel God in the presence of this place? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you. We thank you for participating in ushering in the Spirit of the Lord today. Amen. I will now turn this over to Dr. Washington. God bless you. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time? Are you excited that we are celebrating the 71st simultaneous revival that started in 1951? I tell you, we, we uh, are blessed today, and I thank God for all of you, to all of our pastors, to our revival coordinator, to uh, Bishop Geist, our presider, to all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here. We are excited. I want to welcome you as host pastor of the Second Baptist Church. We're excited uh, that you have come to this place at this particular time. Uh, we pray that your stay here for these three days will be a blessing and that everything you need while you're here will be provided for. Amen. We, um, we are still uh, in our mask wearing stage, but if you choose not to wear a mask, that's fine with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's your option, amen, to wear uh, a mask, but you'll see some of us still wearing the mask. Amen? Amen. And that's fine. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, we have a lecturer here today. The lecturer is in the house, one to whom I know um, from almost 20 years. He's been my pastor. And there's pastors and then there's pastors. And I bless God for the opportunity to know him as a pastor. He has been pastoring New Salem uh, it will be 40 years this year, amen. 40 years. And so we celebrate him for his pastoral experience. We celebrate him for his strength, for his leadership, uh, and particularly for his teaching gift, amen. He has a teaching anointing. Amen. He teaches leaders. He teaches uh, his church, and uh, he's known throughout the country. Uh, he's no stranger to the city of Columbus. He's no stranger to Second Baptist. He is a former president of the Baptist Pastors Conference of Columbus and Vicinity. Amen. He served two terms and then a bonus year. <laughs> As quiet as it's kept, he was doing so good, we forgot to have elections. <laughs> he served a bonus year. We thank God for uh, Dr. Troy, Keith Troy, uh, for what he has meant to this city, what he has meant to this community. Um, and I'm excited to present him to you as our lecturer. By now you know that the wind blew this weekend. And because the wind blew, God sent the wind, he changed some things. He changed the preacher on yesterday. And Dr. McMickle will not be able to be with us until tomorrow because God allowed the winds to blow. But we are at the humble will of God. And so I'm excited. 
to present to you the one that God has chosen for this hour, none other than Dr. Keith Choi. Receive him now. You may be seated to our pastor and our president, Dr. Howard Timothy Washington, to the rest of my colleagues in ministry and to all of you who are here and who are viewing. Um, be careful when you tell God you need to rest. I need you to pray for me because I'm working on forgiveness this morning. Uh, the number one person y'all need me to forgive is the uh, person in charge of coordinating the revival. Y'all need to pray for preachers because preachers just ain't right. We gave each other dap after the service yesterday of how God had moved and and how God had honored the request. And uh, Pastor Little, who is a former friend of mine, <laughs> said to me, we, we, we have a challenge. And as a former president, I'm like, OK, how, how can I be of service? He said, well, Dr. McMickle can't get in here tomorrow. I said, well, you're just in Cleveland. What do you mean you can't get in here? <laughs> but that, 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 that was my honest response. I'm like, that's, he said, I, he said, they got storms. He, he can't get in tomorrow. I said, okay. So he, he said, we have a challenge. And I, I said, so <laughs> who we going to get the lecture? <laughs> and, he, and he said, we have a challenge. I went to public school, so I was a little slow picking up on that pronoun. And then he gave me that Mississippi smile and said, Doc, we have talked and met. And uh, we have decided that you ought to be the one to give the lecture. Now, Pastor Geis, my first thought, we were talking about thinking yesterday, was not a holy thought. Confession is good for this, so I'm, I'm just telling you that. And, and, and the reason it was the holy thought, because on the backside of this weekend, late Saturday night, we experienced a fire at the church. And so we were there till 4 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning. And the Lord allowed us to have service on Sunday without electricity. And so having weathered that storm... And then we have the afternoon service. I, I said to God, okay, we, we need to rest for some things. And you know, God has a sense of humor. Because when you think you're tired, you're not really tired. And so when Little shared with me my responsibility, Pastor King, it meant I had unsolicited homework. <clears throat> I had planned to go home and rest and look, <clears throat> look forward to being an encourager to Dr. Mickle, McMickle and the preacher today and all of that. And little did I know that he and the other people who, I, who are yet to be named, but I will find out who they are, <laughs> collaborated for me to be in this spot. So y'all pray my strength this morning it is also humbling to be standing in this pulpit, especially since the one who gave me birth stood here for 20 years. And so I'm always humbled um, to stand in this spot where most folks don't know. We've spent the last three weeks shifting from dad's illness and sickness. We almost lost him three weeks ago. 
Uh, and we've been in, he was on life support for about four days. And the Lord blessed us with that prayer and he's now moved to rehabilitation. And so we praise God for that. But it's kind of difficult to watch a man who taught you how to walk to learn how to walk all over again. And a man who first fed you, you now have to feed. But God is good in spite of it all because on Thursday he was able to celebrate his 97th birthday. And we're grateful for that. And so we still have a lot to be grateful for, pray for me, my brothers, and our families as we seek to provide the needed physical and spiritual support of what he needs. Can we pray? God, our Father, we come in a moment that you knew long before we knew that we were going to have to stand in this space. We can't be Dr. McMichael. All we can be is Keith Troy. And so, God, open our minds, our hearts, and our insight and try to share with these, your people, what you have for them this morning. It's your servant's prayer. Amen. Amen. Our theme comes out of 1 Peter, the second chapter, and I believe it's verses 9 and 10. What I want to try to do this morning is long ago I, I played baseball and I usually was the lead off hitter. And the coach made it very clear to me that my only job really was not to hit a home run, but just get on base. And those who would be coming behind me will be responsible for getting me home. It's clear to understand the assignment. Because if you don't get on base, then nobody can knock you in. So our attempt this morning is simply to get on base and let God do the rest of what he does, how he does it, when he does it, and who he does it with. So I want to talk about, before we get to verses 8 and 9, I want to kind of set up the first seven verses before that in this, in this book. It is important to understand that the Gospels lead us to two different impressions of Peter. The first is that he was at times an impulsive character. How do you know that, Pastor? Because twice he jumped out of a perfectly seaworthy boat, fully clothed. He had nerve enough to challenge Jesus. And oftentimes, he spoke out of turn. Peter had a bad habit of speaking when he wasn't spoken to. And sometimes, he seemed to demonstrate more energy and creativity that was appropriate at the time. We can't prove it, but Peter may be a biblical case of somebody with ADD. But it's that very, it's that very energy and creativity that underlines the second impression of Peter. Peter was the disciples' unofficial leader. He often served as a spokesman. He was one of the three disciples in Jesus' inner circle, which, which causes me to pause here. Jesus chose Peter, and despite his challenges, he was in the inner circle. You, you didn't get that. Jesus chose Peter. He knew who Peter was. He knew Peter's character. He knew Peter's impulsivity. And yet Jesus still chooses him to be in the inner circle. Sometimes we question when people are certain in certain positions because of what we know about them. But we don't know what God knows. And so sometimes we have to trust God to put us in places that other people don't want us in. 
after Jesus' departure, the disciples looked to Peter to give them direction. This is interesting because there's seemingly a conflicting combination of qualities when you look at Peter. Uh, today, often I, as I identified as high mental energy, Peter's mind didn't rest. Some preachers can identify with that. Peter was always thinking. He was always thought a viewpoint, and his thoughts always led him to action. If Peter had a thought, he was going to act on it soon. If Peter had a thought, it, not, it may not have been a well thought out thought, but if it was a thought, he was going to act on it. Uh, he, he thought about, he didn't think about whether or not the man could hear without an ear. But he thought his ear had to go. And he acted on it. W when we look at Peter, he's always the guy who's popping off, popping up, and speaking really before he is thinking it through. Yesterday, our president reminded us of the importance of the mind and how God can use the mind and how we ought to think first. And I was sitting there smiling to myself because I know most of my great sins have been premeditated. I saw it being carried out in my mind before I acted on it. And somehow, my mind convinced me, even though it was premeditated, I could get away with it. Most of my sins did not surprise me. They had been contemplated. They had been thought about. Matter of fact, I had run the scenario through my mind and looked at the exits. Maybe I'm in here by myself. When, when, when Peter heard questions, he immediately thought answers. When he observed problems, he thought solution. When he encountered options, he thought decisions need to be made. But, but he also demonstrated, Pastor Little, the unfortunate side of that same characteristic because when he heard silence, he thought he ought to speak up. When he encountered disagreement, he thought he ought to challenge it. When he saw error, he thought it was his job to correct it. But whatever the situation was, at least he did think, and his thinking inevitably led to challenge. It's hard to follow people who only think and never act. In, in his younger years, Peter exercised little constraint and his answers and solutions and decisions and speech sometimes strike us as foolishness. Yeah. At times, his behavior was perceived as insensitive, inconsiderate, and immature. But like many great leaders, Peter survived himself. Sometimes the biggest challenge to what God has called you to do is not the congregation. It is not the leadership. It is us ourselves. Because sometimes we mistake what God has called us to do to what we want to do. And so sometimes ministry, my brothers and sisters, is about surviving yourself. I often tell my leaders, if you're the smartest person in the room, the room's too small. Get yourself around some folks who can outthink you and help you because we're not always the last word on everything. Peter survives himself. But how does he survive himself? Not by himself. He survives himself by the guidance of Jesus. And oftentimes, when we get in trouble as leaders and pastors is because we don't heed God's guidance. Sometimes pastoral success can keep you from godly significance. Sometimes celebrityness can get in the way of servanthood. 
when we stop doing windows, when we stop getting our hands dirty, when we can't carry our own Bibles. We, we got to be careful about mistaking who called us to who he called. We, 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 so we, we, we have to be careful, gentlemen, because literally at best, we're just waiters serving a meal we did not cook. And even though the Lord allows us to get a tip, it really doesn't belong to us. With Jesus' guidance, Peter's fertile and active mind matured. At some point, we have to help our folk get out of the high chair and stop spoon feeding them and teach them how to get the word for themselves. And through all his experiences and through all his actions, he develops a more godly character. That this maturity led his process into productive channels. And so the depth of the channels God can dip me in directly correlates with my godly character. I cannot survive deep water if I have a shallow character. And so sometimes we're so busy presenting the Teflon us that we forget sometimes we have to have a tender heart and an understanding. Sometimes it's not words. Sometimes it's just presence. And so God never takes you deeper than you can survive. So if you're in deep water, God's already made a decision. You have the ability to survive it. He collected, he stored, and connected information. He honed his reasoning skill. Peter became a leader because he was not afraid to make a decision. Sometimes we hold our assignments in captivity because we don't want to make the wrong decision. And let me tell you, if you're pastoring, you're going to make some wrong decisions. If you're a leader in a church, you're going to make some wrong decisions. Matter of fact, if you belong to a church, you're going to make some wrong decisions. And his godly character informed the decisions that he made. In honor of my training, I have to ask a relevant question here. What is it? that informs your decisions? Is it what the pew thinks? Or is it what God thinks? Is it what the leadership thinks? Or is it what God told you? What is it that forms the decision for you to be obedient and do what God has asked you to do in spite of what the outcome might be? Anyone serving under a leader who suffers paralysis by analysis will appreciate Peter's quick response time. Anyone working in an organization in which decisions by indecision is the rule understands why people were drawn to Peter. Peter didn't mind making the decisions. Sometimes you can undermine what God's called you to do by refusing to make the decision. As we follow Peter's life through the Gospels, then hear his mature voice resonate throughout the two epistles, we appreciate the optimistic, energetic, highly intelligent man of action with deep character, which is different from the untrained, uneducated fisherman that he's often portrayed. Because when you get to know Peter, he may not have had formal education, but he had life education. And his character took him where education can't take you sometimes. And so we have to begin to understand Jesus is portrayed as a man of action likewise. And Jesus moved with urgency. I'll give you a point, Pastor. 
The Greek word translated immediately in the book of Mark is used 42 times in 16 chapters. The word says Jesus moved immediately. And maybe the reason we missed the flight is because we didn't move immediately. We wanted all the information, and God simply said, trust me today. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. Today, all I have is right now. Move immediately. Sometimes, and I'm pleading with my sisters and brothers in the pew, sometimes you think we move too fast. And you will say to us, we need more time. We need to understand there's some things that God gives us that you've got to trust us with. We, we, we can't wait till everybody understands. It's like deciding on the site for the family reunion and everybody come in agreement, then you're not going to have a family reunion. When, when the church was on the move, when both the Roman and Jewish leaders were opposing it, when Christians were being martyred for their faith, someone needed to make a quick decision, a split section decision. They need to lead. We can only imagine the kinds of issues that could split this frail organization in its birth. When a church leaped over its cultural boundaries to include Greek-speaking Jews, the Samaritans, the local Jews, the Asians, and Greeks and Romans, but because Peter was a leader whose ego would, could endure the threat of disagreement, my brothers, those of us who pastor, and my sisters, don't let your ego get in the way of the assignment. Yeah. There are going to be people who disagree with us. Sometimes you disagree with yourself. <laughs> so why are you surprised when folk who aren't you disagree with you? You, 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 you can't be married a couple, more than a couple of days. And you're going to learn the art of disagreement. Now, disagreement doesn't mean we have to fall out. Because if there's no disagreement in the relationship, then somebody will stop being in the relationship. He was not afraid to act, but he was not careless, yeah. nor did he deal with frivolous matters. Some stuff ain't for you to fix. Some stuff you need to let other folks fix. And if you leave it alone, other folk will find a way to fix it. He, he, he was not careless, nor did he deal frivolously with critical matters. His godly character wouldn't allow that. But he was not afraid to move and understand his leadership. It was important for him through those kind of times for the church to get things done. What I like about Peter is Peter was a leader who made decisions that matter. Some stuff you worried about don't matter. Don't get bogged down in the stuff that other folks can handle. My, my pastor said I've almost been at New Salem 40 years. And, and I can tell you, I pastor very differently in this 39th year than I did in the first couple of years. Sometimes no is a complete sentence. It don't need explanation. And I don't care how many different times you come at me with the same question, it's still going to be no. Also, I have discovered that it doesn't hurt you to admit you don't know. What I don't know, I hire other folks to know so that I don't have to know it. And so it's okay to admit your limitations because where we get off is where God gets on. And God will send answers to the things that concern you. You don't have to do everything. 
right, right now they're at the church trying to figure out how to get that electricity on. Now the old me would have been there. Not that I know the first thing about electricity. But I would have been watching. But I got somebody who's there who's 84 years of age who knows more than I'll ever know about electricity. And when he says everything's all right, it'll be all right, which allowed me to be here, not dealing with electricity, but dealing with power. So that, that, that brings us then to this second chapter in 1 Peter. And it says, therefore, rid yourselves. It's a tough chapter. It's a, I, 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 don't take it personal. But it says, rid everybody in the church. No, that, that ain't what that says. Read everybody else. No, no, the text says, the text says, read yourself. Now, now remember, this was Peter talking. Of, of all, that's a big word, mal, mal, list, malice, malice, uh, malice. It says all malice. So even though I'm upset with little, I can't have malice toward little. And, 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 and the second part says all deceit. He said, they just told me they wanted me to do this. Not we got a problem. <laughs> Hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. So it suggests then, if I'm going to follow what Peter's saying here, I got some work to do on me. Be before I can get everybody else straight, before I can point out your stuff and what you're not doing, and all, I got to deal with me. Just whisper to the person next to you, I got some homework, I got some homework. And he gives us an example. He says, like newborn babies crave pure, here it comes, spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. So when people first come to us, they're babes in Christ. But, but I want to raise the question with my colleagues, what is the process in place in the ministry that you lead to grow people spiritually so they get out of the high chair and start walking on their own? If they only can get a word when you're preaching, something wrong with the process. And so we have to be careful because we too often want to spoon feed folk and make them think we got the only spoon. It says like newborn babies, they have a craving for pure spiritual milk. To that it may grow up in your salvation. So people ought to be different at death than they are at life. There ought to be some signs of spiritual growth. So let me ask a second relevant question. Is anybody going to be in heaven because they know you? When we get to your tree, is there going to be any fruit? Or was your only way of getting folks to heaven was getting them to the pastor to preach? Did your life in the marketplace make a difference for folks who may never get to us on a Sunday morning? Because if it can't keep you money through Saturday, what do you think it's going to do for them on Sunday? At some point, growth ought to be determined beyond our shout on Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, now that you have tasted, now here, here comes the shout. You're getting spiritual food. 
And the takeaway is that you've tasted what you've eaten. And your determination of what you've been fed is that the Lord is good. Which suggests then you really can't appreciate how good God has been unless you've really been hungry to taste it. See, unless you've been through something, unless you know what real hunger is, unless you know what it means that your stomach and your back are having a conversation, when you go to bed on Saturday night because you ain't got no food, when your main meal becomes peanut butter and toast. Hunger. And when you taste what God has to offer, you then know that God is good. So in the midst of my emptiness, in the midst of my hunger, if I get to him, everything's going to be all right. So maybe what's wrong is not the church, not the pastor. It's maybe I'm eating at the wrong. We, 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 we've been teasing our children during this pandemic because... I'm blessed to be married to an outstanding cook, and uh, I believe that, that that was part of God's gift to me, because the Lord knows I can't cook and don't plan on cooking, so he sent me what I needed. But the kids will often use this thing called DoorDash, which means you order from a restaurant, from somebody you ain't seen, who cooks a meal that you don't know, and puts it in a vehicle, driven by somebody you've never met. And you pay for it in advance. Now, there, there were several challenges with that. First of all, you don't know the cook. You don't know what they put in the meal. And the person delivering you never met. And yet, we trust them to deliver something that's edible. I serve a God that every morning sends new mercies, not leftover mercies, not yesterday's mercy, and I have a track record that every time I've been hungry or thirsty, God has fed me and given me water. I've never went and wanted anything, and you telling me I can't trust him in my moment of need, you lost your mind. You got DoorDash face. But every now and then, my memory is a friend, my faith is a friend to my memory and reminds me, we've been this way before and when you didn't know what to do, didn't God do what he said he was going to do? So I can, I can, my grandmother was a great sweet potato pie maker. Matter of fact, you couldn't go to a house and there wasn't sweet potato pie. Her nickname was Sweet. My grandmother had been dead 20 something years, but in my mind. I can still catch the smell of the kitchen. I can still taste whatever she did with it. And, and so I'm kind of a sweet potato pie snob because I know what hers tasted like. And it's hard for most folk to get me in that same place because hers just had love put to it. It, it just tasted different to me. Now, if I know that about my grandmother, how much more do I know about a God who's taken me from where I was to where I am now? Who's guided me and fed me? See, I, every now and then, you need to just close your eyes and tap on your memory so your faith can be filled with fond memories. In your dark moments. The moments when ain't nobody around. You ready to quit and throw in the towel. And you think you've done enough. You're going unappreciated. Your family ain't even there to support you. 
It's in those moments. Not the hallelujah moments. It's in the dark moments. Not on anniversary Sundays, but on the Sunday they get ready to vote you out. You got to remember that if they put you out, God going to put you in somewhere else. Not nowadays, these, these athletes have this thing called the transfer portal. And if they don't like their situation, they, they can change who they're playing for. Uh, Bishop Clark, I, I'm glad to know that long before college athletics, God had a transfer portal. He, he, he took me from where I was. They didn't ask me my opinion, but he realized where I needed to go. A and God transferred me without my permission. But when I got to where he wanted me to be, even though it didn't look like what I had visualized, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Then it goes on and says, as you come to him, Here's the transition to close. The living stone. Rejected by humans. But chosen by God. And precious to him. Here comes your shout. You also like living stones. See, he's the stone. But when you get in relationship with him, you become stones. It is interesting to me because the person that this is ascribed to is a man named Peter, who Jesus says upon this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus takes a man that's guilty of the same sin as Judas. Both denied him. Both turned their backs on him. Both walked away from him in the hour of need. One commits suicide, but the other finds salvation. Same sin, same sin, different relationship. Judas didn't have any hope because he thought he ended his own life because he came to himself and he thought himself was all he had. But Peter, even though he committed the same sin, went back to what he had been doing and stayed lo alive long enough for God to find him fishing on a riverbank where he was most comfortable. And even though the rest of the brother on around, he said, Peter, I need a little time with you. Peter, I, I, I know you're confused right now and you don't know how I'm going to react because after all, I heard what you said. And you didn't just say it once. This is why I know Peter is Baptist, because he repeated himself. You said it three times. No, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. But I'm the kind of God who comes back and deals with every denial in your life. Every time you deny me, I'm going to give you another chance to ask me, do you love me? Not one time. Do you love me? Not two times. But three different times, he says to him, do you love me? He was a mathematician. He calls for every negative. He gives Peter a chance to turn into a positive and cancel those denials. Here's the good news. Bishop Washington, for every time I've denied him, every morning he says, do you still love me? Every afternoon, do you still love me? I've walked out on him and he's followed me. I wouldn't speak and he showed up at 4 o'clock. God will give you a chance to make your negatives right. Don't you commit suicide. God's on the other side of your betrayal. 
your mistake, your misfortune. As a matter of fact, you can't be a useful stone till you get in relationship with the living stone. Let the church say amen. amen. We thank God for that lecture. That was some lecture. God bless you, Dr. Troy, for that. God has smiled on me. He has said, me free. Oh, God has smiled on me. Yes, he has. He's been good to me. Let's try that one more time. God has. God has. Yes, he has. Smile. While we're singing that this is, this is a time that we have set aside for offering. Come on, let's give God a hand praise to be able to give to this wonderful revival. And we just thank him for what he's already done and what he's about to do. As, as we're coming around with our offering with the ushers, what I would like to do, I would like to, as they play softly, what I would like to do, I would like to, I would like to impede to you that we would like everyone to give at least $10 if they can, if you can. $10 if you can. And, and uh, preachers, if you can, give us 20 10 if you can, if you can't understand whatever God has you if it's five God will bless the five amen but we're asking for 10 and 20 from our pastors amen you know my mind is not that great can you give me for those who want to give, can we put the, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for those who uh, give electronically, you can give to dollar sign BPCCV 1951. That's to our cash app, to our Givelify. It would be Baptist Pastors Conference of Columbus. We will take it all. <laughs> God bless you. If you can follow the instructions of our ushers, God bless you.
Amen. Come on, let's give our music department a hand. We thank God for them. Amen. 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 Well, right now, what I would like to do, uh, introduction of the speaker of the hour is Pastor Bass here. It's going to be Pastor Taylor, Dr. Taylor. We thank God. Dr. Taylor, if you can come on up. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Come on, let's give God some hand praise in this place. I have the distinct privilege to stand in the stead of my two partners in this revival triophony, uh, Pastor Bass and Pastor Harper are not able to be with us right now. They are in seminary. So they chose me, amen, to stand and to introduce uh, this great man of God. Uh, I know if they were here, I know Pastor Bass would be getting his shout on and Pastor Harper would be doing what I call the Holy Ghost slam dunk. Because if you've ever seen Pastor Harper preach, when he get happy, his feet get about this high off the ground. I would like to introduce to you today our evangelist, Serenity Baptist Church, New Creation Baptist Church, and the Good Shepherd Baptist Church. We've all come together and we have asked Reverend Reginald Taylor to be our evangelist for three days this week. He is the pastor of the historic Second Baptist Church of Sandusky, Ohio. Pastor Taylor is the offshoot, is an offshoot of Dr. Frank E. Ray pastor of the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. So I'm going to ask y'all to do me a favor. Let's stand, if you can, and let's reach our hands towards heaven and say, Father God, give Pastor Taylor a word for today. Giving honor to God, the speaker for the hour, the shepherd of this house, and also my pastor, Pastor Powell, and all who lend the ear to hear what God has to say. Amen. I'm just going to go ahead and not be before you long and minister in song. I dreamed of a city. Called glory so bright, um, so fair. When I entered the gates, I cried, Glory, the angel.
Then I said, I want to see Jesus, for he's the one who died for all.
before God. Glory. I bow before you. I bow before you. Glory. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, glory. You're amazing, God. Oh, I glory. Two past uh, Washington. Our coordinator, Pastor Little. To all of these other pastors and preachers. And to each of you, our sisters and brothers, we are grateful to God for today. To once again be in the land of the dying pressing our way toward the land of the living. I'm certain by now that all of us have at least stopped once this morning to say unto the Lord, thank you for waking us up early this morning, realizing that he didn't have to do it, but he did. And for that, we all ought to be grateful. And isn't it a blessing to know that God allows your name to show up on his wake-up list this morning? He is just an awesome God. What can you say about Pastor Troy? did a marvelous job. Amen. Let's give him some love. I want to just take a moment. I won't be before you long to acknowledge my wife, Sister Taylor, if you will stand. She's back in the back. Amen. God bless you. Then I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge my moderator, Pastor Clayton Howard. Uh, thank you. And then I want to say thank you to these three preachers that thought enough of me to extend an invitation for me to come and say a word in the Lord's behalf. I want to call your attention to the book of 1 Peter. Certainly happy to see Pastor Arrington, who's one that I look up to, who is a scholar in the word, He's here in the city as well this week. First Peter chapter 1. And 
I want to take a look at verse 6. First Peter chapter 1 verse 6. You'll find these words recorded in the text. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. I was taught that there are several ways that one can look at a verse and you read it the way that we just read it, it says one thing, but God is such an awesome God until if you read that verse backwards, it makes better sense. And when you read it backwards, it says manifold trials causes your heart to be heavy. But don't worry because it only lasts for a season. So in the meantime, rejoice. I want to talk from the subject. You still got something to shout about. You still got something to shout about. And I solicit your prayers. I would like to begin by posing a question. And I'm sure that each of us can answer the question and be truthful with our answer. And that question is, have you ever had a pity party? <laughs> I mean, you got to the point to where you got in your feelings and all of a sudden, you discovered that your only focus was what you was going through. As you sit there and pondered and thought about this little problem that I can't seem to solve. All of a sudden, this pity party start inviting its nieces, nephews, and cousins. And when you looked up, you discovered that you had a real pity party going on. And if you're like I am, sometimes um, you are going through and sometimes it seems as though you have blinders on both sides of your eyes. And you're focusing only on the problem that lies ahead. And you ask yourself the question, when will life ever smooth out? Well, if one has ever gone to the hospital and ever seen someone that was connected to a heart monitor, you notice that as long as there was breath in the body, the heart monitor goes up and down. And the question that we ask about when will life smooth out 
Life will only smooth out when we are laid out. That no, that as long as we are on this tyristic ball called planet Earth, the Bible says that we will have troubles. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We will have trials. Yes. And we will have tribulations. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But thanks be to God that he didn't stop there because he said, but be of good cheer. Yes. 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 Because I have overcome. Yes, when we look at this book called First Peter, Pastor Droy did a marvelous job telling us about Peter. Because some of us can really relate to Peter because Peter was one that his name, first of all, was Simon. And then they changed his name from Simon to Cephas. And this particular Peter that we are looking at was one that had some characteristics of some of us that are sitting here today. Because we know that Peter, first of all, was a cusser. And then Peter was also a cutter. When we look at Peter, we know that Peter was one that looked at Jesus and said to Jesus, other folk might forsake you, but Doc, I got your back. Peter was one that would say, I'm your friend until the end. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, before the clock crows thrice, you shall have denied me three times. But when we look at the first verse in chapter one of this book of Peter, it says, Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at this, we must not rush past words because words are important. Because the scripture says Peter, an apostle. Uh, one would say that we have apostles that are around today, but if the truth is told, there were only 12 original apostles. And, and one would say, and not trying to discredit them, but say that they were the second group of apostles. And, and what we must understand is that whether they be a, uh, there's no more first group of apostles living, but if you profess that you are a apostle of our day and time, your message ought to reflect what God has given us. And that is, the word of God. The record says that Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers that are scattered. Here he talks about us being strangers and what we must understand is that all of us are really strangers to this world. Because the Bible says that this world really Ain't none of our home. But we are pilgrims passing by. And watch this, brothers and sisters. Pilgrims don't set up residence on a bridge. But a bridge is designed to get you from one side over to the other. Do I have a witness? When we look at this, we must note here that the record says Peter and an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says that they were scattered. And this word scattered is a, a word that is called diasporas, which means that Christians at this time had been placed in many 
different regions. Yeah. Yeah. And when we look at it, uh, we can relate to it when we go back to our childhood because if you ever sang in the choir, you can remember the choir oftentimes singing a song, 12 Gates to the City, Three Gates in the East, Three Gates in the West, Three Gates in the North, and Three Gates in the West, 12 Gates to the City. Hallelujah. Oh, my brothers and sisters, as we take a look at these Christians that were scattered, they were nothing more than pilgrims in an unfriendly world. I'm reminded of two ships. There was a ship called the Titanic. Uh -huh. And then there was a ship called the Mayflower. Uh -huh. The Titanic had over 2,000 passengers. Yeah. But the Mayflower had less than 200 pills. Pastors, I come to ask you a question this morning. Do you have more passengers in your church? Or do you have more pilgrims in your church? Oh, he says that we are scattered throughout Pontius. Galatia, Asia, Cappadocia, and Bithynia. Watch this, he says, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Yeah, yeah. We can take that word elect and choose to use another word called chosen and I think I ought to have about 15 witnesses in here and I'll make 16 that can testify that it is a blessing to be chosen by the Lord do I have a witness a little boy one day was adopted. His parents had a biological son uh -huh. and the biological son did all he could to make the adopted boy feel bad. Uh -huh. He would look at him and say, you adopted, you adopted boy don't ever forget you are adopted yeah, yeah, yeah. Little adopted boy had took and taken as much as he could take uh, my Lord, my Lord. he grabbed that boy in the collar uh, yeah. he said let me set the record straight, hey, come on, set it straight. he said your mama uh, and your daddy uh, had to have you, but they chose me. Come on, God. Come on, God. Yeah. Yeah. Chosen. Yeah. Chosen. Yeah. Somebody in here yeah. ought to rejoice in the choice yeah. Yeah. that God has selected you to be a part of his children. He says here, elect according to the foreknowledge, which means that God really saw your life before you really got here. The fact about it is that not only did God see our lives before we got here, 
But God also saw Jesus' life before he got here. Because watch this. God, before Jesus got here, he had already died at Calvary before he was born in Bethlehem. You got proof on that? Yeah. The Son of Man was slain before the foundation of the world. Oh, my brothers and sisters. Says the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification. And when we look at the word through, God is trying to tell us that whatever you're going through, you can make it if you don't give up. I, I told my church several months ago that Psalm 23 say, Yea, though I walk through the valley yeah. of the shadows of death. Yeah. I told them, you got to understand that if you can handle the pull, God can pull you through. Yeah. Yeah. Look at what yeah. he says. Yeah. I'm almost about done. He says through the sanctification. Now, when we look at sanctification, some Baptist people think that the Church of God in Christ are the only saved folk. Yeah. Come on. Come on. But what we must understand that the word sanctification means to be set apart yeah. or set yeah. aside yeah. for a specific use. Yeah. And watch this. God can't use you if he don't want you, to, if you don't want to be used. You see, God ain't going to force nothing on you. Uh -huh. Watch this. I'm almost uh, done. He says, through the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Mm -hmm. Then he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at it, we must note that all three names are mentioned in that text. Uh -huh. Blessed be the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. If you look at the word Lord Jesus Christ, there's a message in there if you don't read too fast. Uh -huh. What's the message? Lord is the word that he uses by saying uh, Christos, Karios. What is that? The Lord wants to deliver us. Then he wants to develop us. Then he wants to direct us. We don't have a problem being delivered. We don't have a problem in being developed. But where our problem lies in is that don't none of us want to be directed. I ain't never seen a group of people where everybody grown. But the last time I checked, the record was that we are our heavenly father's children. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do I have a witness? Yeah. Watch this, and I'm pressing toward a close here. He says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has be." Gotten us again. 
This word begotten us again means that the Lord has redeemed us. Because of when sin entered into the world, when Adam ate of the unforbidden fruit, our genes became defective genes. And God knew that he couldn't use us with defective genes. So what he did, he dispatched his son, caught a nine-month train, got off in the land of Bethlehem of Judea, and gave us a new set of genes. I know you didn't know it, but don't you know that just because you got a new set of genes that God didn't take away the old set? Watch this. The old set is still laying dormant in us. And some of us, we Used to cuss, uh-huh. but because we got a new set of genes, we ain't cussing no more. All right. yes, but if we are rubbed the wrong way, yeah. Come on, Rev. we'll reach back and pull up that old set of genes. I'm taking too long. He says, which has begotten us again to a lively hope. This word hope is a word, elphis in the Greek means expectation. How do you expect God to do something for you and you ain't never been through nothing? You got to go through some stuff. And know that God will come through for you. Because watch this. All of us in here ought to have what I call a faith file. Uh And in that faith file ought to be the things that God has done for you. And the things that God has delivered you from. And if he did it yesterday... And he's the same God today, yesterday, and forevermore. If he did it for you last year, he's the same God. He can do it again. He says, through a lively hope to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaviness. For you, watch this, and then he says, and I'm going home, he says, who are kept who are kept God is in the preserving business. I can remember coming up in Memphis, Tennessee Drive about 45 miles outside of Memphis. Get off at exit 13 and Highway 64. Travel another 15 miles to East Tennessee. Drove the car up the hill. And when I got up the hill, my grandmama was in the kitchen with pots on the stove. Making her what she called Preserves. Yeah, yeah. I said, I said, Big Mama, how you make preserves? She said, Oh, Regis. I would get the boys and they would get the fruit, bring it in the house, set it either on the table or on the windowsill. Just in case there were some bugs on the inside Uh and I needed them to come out. Big mama would get them big pots and 
as she was preparing the pots, she'd have us peeling the fruit. If it was peaches, pears, and she would put it in the pot, and she would put in the pot all of the ingredients, and they would smell a fresh aroma throughout the house. While the preserves were cooking, Big Mama had another pot and took mason jars and boiled the mason jars. And when they cooled off and the preserves cooled a little bit, we would help her put preserves in the jar. She would take the jar and put a lid on them. Then she would take and screw the top yeah. on the jar. Uh-huh. And then she would do something. She would then turn around and take a piece of plastic and put it around the lid. Uh-huh. I said, what you doing that for, Big Mama? She said, trying to keep the air out uh-huh. and keep the aroma and the taste in. Uh-huh. She would get in and she would take them and push some of them up under the shift rope. Uh-huh. Then she would take some and push them up under the, dessert, uh, under the bed. And she said, come on, Regis, let's watch my stories. She would perhaps be watching the young and restless. Uh-huh. The edge of night. Do I have a witness? And all of a sudden, you hear some say, pop. I'm like, what is that? She said, baby, that ain't nothing but Big Mama's preserves sealed. Well, did you not know that just like the preserves, my grandmama had a seal for the preserves, God got a seal for us. Watch this, the Bible says that when we accept him, we are sealed until the day of redemption. And, and, and he says that the seal is so tough that you can't even get yourself out of the master's hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then he says, wherein ye greatly rejoice. Though now yes, sir. for a season, yes, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold Temptation. What I like about this, and I'm cutting across the field, he says, what you're going through is only going to last for a season. James Brown was one of the baddest fellas on the stage. Had a lot of hits. Matter of fact, James Brown packed arenas all across the country by singing a song that almost had one word in the song. James would get on the stage and would be shouting, please, please, please. He was in his season. But when he jumped on his wife, his season was over. Muhammad Ali was one of the world's greatest boxers. Would look at Joe Frazier and say, ugly Joe, I'm going to knock you out in the third round. I'm going to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Uh-huh. 
He was in his season. But when he met Larry Holmes, he couldn't float no more. He couldn't stain no more. Because his what? Season was over. Then he says, it's only for a season. He said, but if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Yes, he says here, that problems, they come in all shapes and colors. He says that the devil sometimes will disguise how he approaches you. But what I like about the God in whom I say that God says for every multicolored trial in our lives that God has a manifold grace and uh, isn't it a joy to know that we still have something to shout about. <laughs> you know, we still can rejoice. <laughs> In other words, the songwriter said, you don't have to wait till the battle is over, but you can shout right now. Have I got a witness here? Yeah. I got to leave you here. But I want to tell you uh, the reason why uh, that I can shout uh, is because of what Jesus uh, did on Mount Calvary. He was there. He died uh, so that I may become rich. Uh, he became disgraced uh, so I might have amazing grace. Have I got a witness here? Is there anybody in here can testify that God is a God that deserves to be praised? Have I got a witness here? All my brothers and sisters, I want to leave you when I tell you I'm glad that I still got something to shout about because of when Jesus was on Mount Calvary, I heard him say, I'm going down in a grave. Have I got a witness here? I heard him say, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, three days and three nights, so shall the heart of man be down in the earth. I'll die. But I'll rise again. Have I got a witness here? You know what happened. They buried him in Joseph's new tomb. He stayed there all night Friday. Stayed right there all day Saturday. Stayed right there all night Saturday night. But early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. Have I got a witness here? Well, let me bring it a, a little closer home. Can I tell you why I shout? I got seven reasons why I shout. Number one, he woke me up this morning 
number two uh, he woke me up this morning number three he woke me up this morning number four he woke me up this morning number five he woke me up this morning number six he woke me up this morning number seven he woke me up Give God a hand, praise. We thank God for Pastor Taylor coming and bringing us that word. Amen, 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 amen. God is good. I'll ask again, is God good? Amen. Has he done something for you? Has he made a way for you? Well, at this time, what we, we would not be called children of God if we did not open this part of our, our service for those that may need a word of prayer, for those of you that may have lost their way or just want to solidify their relationship with God. This is your opportunity. Will you stand with me? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. This is your opportunity right now. Just now. may be seated. Gracious and all wise God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for what has just been done today. Lord, we hope and pray that you, Lord, you are pleased in this service. Lord, we ask, Heavenly Father, that everything that has been said will permeate the hearts and the mind of your people that will make us better in our walk. These things we ask in your precious and righteous name. Amen. Let everybody say amen. 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 I believe this uh, concludes today's service. We won't do a benediction. All I will say is may the Lord keep you until we see each other again tomorrow. Amen. You may go in peace. God bless you.